Well, let me start by answering a question or two. First, I'm, where's Tom? Tom's right. I'm not Pastor Jim. My name is Rob McCroy. I'm not a pastor, and I'm not an elder in the church. And by all means, I'm pretty new to our church. So why am I standing here before you this morning? I'm kind of wondering the same thing myself right now. No, I do know why, and it's, it's something that took me years to understand, and that is when God calls, I need to say yes. Since my wife Pam and I started coming to Calvary Arlington last September, we've been welcomed and cared for by many of you. So thank you. I've met a number of you, and I'm looking forward to getting to know, to know more of you in the months ahead. So I'm not going to tell you all about me right now, but as we go along this morning, I'll share some things so you get to know me a bit better. A couple of months ago, Pam and I had dinner with Pastor Jim and his wife, Lori. Jim already knew why we moved here to Calvary, but he didn't know how much I love the style of expository teaching. I love God's Word, and I, and I love that kind of teaching, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. He knew my involvement in Bible study fellowship and that I serve as teaching leader for the men's class in Everett. That's where I get my passion for expository teaching. Over dinner, he learned that each week I, I prepare a message and deliver that on Monday nights. Well, then the natural question came, can I hear one of them? Right then I knew, and now you know why, I'm here this morning. When God calls, I need to say yes. Now, sometimes it's pretty easy like this to hear God's voice. But I have to admit that many times I wish God would just plainly tell me, Rob, don't do that. Then point me in the right direction and hear him say, here, do this instead. This is best for you. Is it just me? No, oh, good. Make sure I wasn't alone here. This morning, we're, this morning, we're going to look at a psalm that speaks to us. Many psalms are the other way around, directed to God, but Psalms 37 is God speaking to us. King David, who wrote the psalm, and as we know from verse 25, was getting older. Some commentators speculate that David was passing along wisdom to his son, the soon-to-be king, Solomon. Whatever the case may be, we can be assured the wisdom here found in these verses was inspired by God and passed along down to all the generations and right here to us this morning. So open your Bibles with me, about right in the middle. And find Psalms 37. We'll look at the first few verses together. Psalms 37. Do not fret because of evildoers. Be not envious toward wrongdoers. For they will wither quickly like the grass and fade like the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and cultivate faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he'll give you the desires of your heart. Commit your ways to the Lord. Trust also in him, and he'll do it. He'll bring forth your righteousness as the light, and your judgment as the noonday. I love this. God is telling us, don't do this. Do this instead. This is what's best for you. So our passage starts with God telling us what not to do, followed by several things to do, teaching us what's best for us. So let's look at verses 1 and 2. I'll call it, Don't Fret or Be Envious. So how many of you have taught others before? Oh, with lots of hands. So, so you know if the subject you're teaching isn't familiar to you, or it's been a while since you taught it last, you know there's a fair amount of preparation that goes into the whole process. 
Over the years at work, I've, I've trained on different software applications. I've given any number of business presentations. And I know one thing's for sure. If you have to teach it, you have to learn it. So as I dug into our passage this past week, as I prepared for this morning, I was challenged to dig a little deeper. Verse 1 says, do not fret because of evildoers. Don't worry. Well, that's easy enough to understand. But it didn't take me long to find out that all the commentators tell us that the, in the original Hebrew, this carries a lot more meaning than how we typically understand fret or worry. Boyce wrote, the words do not fret literally mean do not get heated, which is also how we might express it. Or we might say, don't get all worked up or be cool. This is a tough one. Don't get heated. Don't get all worked up. Now, I hate this term, but I'm going to use it anyway this morning. Triggered. There are things that trigger us, that push our buttons, and boom, we're all heated. We're all worked up. I mean, calm to ticked off in record time. Some of you know what I'm talking about. Just the right topic comes up, and bam, the debate's on. Okay, so we're going to practice. Ready? But be cool. We're in church. I'm going to say just one word. You ready? Cilantro. You either love it or you hate it, right? Yeah, the debate's on. Seriously, though, we, we don't have to look very far to find something that, that works us up. These student protests that are happening around the country, I got to tell you, they do it for me. All I have to do is watch the news for a little while and my blood pressure goes up. I don't know what it is for you. Maybe it's the election in November or just politics in general. Maybe it's the traffic on I-5 where everyone's out for themselves. Seems like they're always trying to cut me, I mean, cut you off, right? <laughs> just to get one car length ahead. You know, the age-old question is this. Why do the righteous suffer while the wicked seem to prosper? Asaph writes in Psalm 73, how does God know? And is there knowledge with the Most High? Behold, these are the wicked and, and always at ease and they have increased wealth. Surely in vain I have kept my, my heart pure. I have washed my hands in innocence. For I have been stricken all day long and chastened every morning. Now before God points us in the right direction, he warns us of one of our human tendencies. Look with me at the second half of the verse. Be not envious toward wrongdoers. Don't envy wrongdoers. At first glance, it's like, well, I don't do that. We don't envy evildoers or, or wrongdoers. Listen to Merriam-Webster's definition of envy. It goes like this. Painful or resentful awareness of an advantage enjoyed by another joined with a desire to possess the same advantage. Right? I've worked for Premier Blue Cross for in IT for the last 28 years. Before COVID and all this remote, remote work thing going on, the parking lot was often overflowing. It was hard to find a parking place. Premier's offices are located down in Montlake Terrace on 220th. In the, afternoon, I, in the afternoons, I'd often take a walk. I'd walk around the perimeter of the parking lot. It was about a mile, all in all. And I'd often find myself wondering how much money my coworkers must be making to afford all these cars. There used to be this, this beautiful Audi A5 convertible, deep, dark, olive green. I'm telling you, it would have been the best commuter car. 
I was envious of the means they had and the things they had. But it's not just envy of things, is it? What about health? We look at that guy who's, who's smoked and drank his whole life and doesn't seem to be suffering any ill effects. And, and we ask, Lord, why am I going through all of this? We envy what another has. We get caught up comparing what we only see with what we know. Comparison. It's a dangerous thing that we should be on guard against. Anytime we find ourselves wishing we had what they have, wondering how to keep up with the Joneses, we need to stop and realize that we need to move closer to God. I kind of lump this in with fear. Anytime I find myself afraid, fearful, it's a trigger. Sorry, I used it again. It's a trigger for me to know that I need to move closer to God and remember his truths and that he has a plan just for me. Jeremiah says in chapter 29, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not harm you, Plans to give you hope in a future. So don't worry or be envious. Instead, come closer to God and lean into His Word. Be cool. Keep calm and carry on, we used to say, right? David, late in his life, he gives us the benefit of his wisdom. And from Scripture, we know that kings were were to meditate day and night on God's law. So David understood that we shouldn't focus on the immediate things of this world, but put them in the context of the eternal. And that's what he's telling us in verse 2, when he speaks about the ungodly. He says, For they will wither quickly like grass and fade like the green herb. When envy works its way in, when we get all worked up about what's going on with someone else, we need to stop and remember that our time here, this earthly life, is, is just a little bit of time when we think about the big picture of eternity. James says in chapter 4, you're just a vapor. Some translations say a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. I turn 62 next, next month. Pam and I have been married for 37. I choke up. We've been married for 37 years. We have four adult daughters, three son in laws, and two grandchildren. When did all that happen? <laughs> you get a little older and you look back and you wonder how time goes by so fast. Just a vapor in the context of eternity. The company I've worked for over the last almost 30 years has changed a lot. We used to be more like a family back in the day. The last five or six years seemed to be more about the bottom line than, than people. There's been a lot of reorgs and, and layoffs. And I'm always disappointed in my company when that happens and, and upset for those that are affected. And I can tell you I've been concerned for my job, worried and lost sleep more than a few nights. Last Saturday morning, I'm, I'm carpooling home from Everett from our Bible study leaders meeting with my friend Will, who's a financial planner. Will's heard about my company, and he knows my story and my concerns. And he asked me if I was ready to retire. I've been pretty much resolved to work till I'm 67. Five more years of the stress of what the company's become, wondering if I'll have a job, thinking, what would I do? How would we... 
Well, you get the picture. Will and I talked about our, my 401k, my pension, Social Security, and all that. And he looked at me and he said, you'll be fine. If you had to, you could retire now. I can't tell you the relief I felt. It's given me a new perspective, a sense of security about the future. David's reminding us here that for the wicked, there is no security. They'll wither quickly like grass when the hot sun comes. But for us who have put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, the best is yet to come. Amen? There it is. Peter tells us in his second letter, chapter 3, but in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. One of my passions is, is getting out in the woods. I love to explore the forest service roads on my, on my motorcycle. And when you're, when you're riding down those rough roads, one of the things you have to remember is to keep your eyes up because stuff comes out at you really fast. And if you're looking down, well, things aren't going to go well. It's not bad advice for all of us. When the road's rough, remember, look up, keep your eyes on Jesus, remembering we'll spend eternity with our Savior Jesus beyond all the stuff in this world. And guys, that should give us security and assurance that God is in control. He knows what's going on and how we're only here for a little while. This whole psalm is rooted in the law. When God made the covenant with Israel, recorded in Leviticus 26 and again in Deuteronomy 27 through 30, God owned the land. And if the nation obeyed him, they could live in the land and enjoy its blessings. But if Israel disobeyed the Lord, he'd first discipline them in the land through invasion and drought and famine. And if they continue to rebel, he take them out of the land, captivity. But it seemed that the wicked were prospering and that God wasn't doing anything about it. The righteous could fret over the problem. They could leave the land or, or go on being faithful, trusting the Lord to keep his word. You see, David took the long view the long view of the situation, and wanted the people to believe God's promises and wait on him. In verses 3 through 6, David gives us some do's to help us combat worry and envy and, and doubt when we're wondering about God's plan. So the first do this morning, I'm calling do trust, verse 3. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and cultivate faithfulness. Trust in the Lord and do good. Doesn't need much explanation. David is counseling us, instead of worrying and envying, simply trust God and do good for his glory. David must have understood just how quickly and easily we can get distracted from the simple work of trusting and doing good. Fixating on what appears to be prosperity of the wicked is one way that we can easily get distracted. Charles Spurgeon said, Faith cures fretting. Sight is cross-eyed and views things only as they seem, hence the, hence the envy. Faith has clear optics to behold things as they really are, hence her peace. A friend of mine at work recently found out he had cancer in his tongue and in a lymph node. He had this complex surgery on his tongue and, and is now being prepped for radiation and chemo. In 2018, I found out that I had cancer in my right eye and I also had a surgery followed up by radiation. 
These last few weeks, God's reminded me what I went through, placing my trust in him through all of that. God wants us to do good. He's given me the opportunity to point my friend to God's word, some verses that brought me peace through that time. God's given me the chance to share my experiences with my friend. So when God gives you the chance to show the love of Jesus to someone, don't miss it. You might be the only person. Trust in the Lord and do good. You know what, church? Sunday service is one hour a week. You have another 167 hours this week to do good. So how are you going to use them? Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and, and cultivate faithfulness. You see, some of God's people were tempted to leave the land, which was tantamount to saying that God wasn't faithful and couldn't be trusted. But, er, but David urged them to stay in the land and trust God for what they needed. Look at verse 27 with me. David says, depart from evil and do good, so you will abide forever. Each tribe, clan, and family in Israel had its assigned inheritance, which was not to pass into other hands. And the Lord, and the Lord promised to care for the land of the faithful. Now, depending on the translation, verse 3, it might read, enjoy safe pasture or, or feed on his faithfulness. Maybe enjoy security. Dwell in the land. The Hobby Lobby sign says, Bloom where you're planted. In recent years, I've heard over and over, I'm out of here. This state is, well, you fill in the blank, right? I've seen many people leave for greener pastures. Idaho, Montana, Texas, Tennessee. No matter where you're at, you can cultivate faithfulness and rely on God and live out his call for you right where you're at. If we're faithful to God, he'll be faithful to us. Trusting the Lord is, is a key theme David wants us to get from his psalm here. Instead of focusing on our own ideas of how God might let us down, how it looks like he's letting the wicked prosper all around us, David tells us to cultivate faithfulness, feed on his faithfulness, focus on his faithfulness. This should be where our thinking is. Our second do this morning is, is delight. Do delight, verse 4. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he'll give you the desires of your heart. A verse we probably all know. At first glance, this seems like simple if-then logic. The software engineer is coming out in me now. If this condition exists, then the following will happen, right? He'll give you the desires of your heart. Okay, then. I, I love my Honda motorcycle. But Lord, the real, the real desire of my heart, Lord, is that new BMW GS1300. You know the one. You know the one I want. I delight myself in you today as I make my way to the BMW dealership. It's a trap that we can all fall into. The trap is if we do all the right things, there's the if, then... God should give us what we want. And here's the scary part. If we believe this is how God works, well, then what happens when God isn't meeting our expectations? What is David telling us then? If we look at the word delight, it speaks of the abundance of the blessings we have in the Lord himself, totally apart from, from what he gives us. To enjoy the blessings and ignore the blesser? Well, that's idolatry. 
In Jesus Christ, we have all God's treasures. If we truly delight in the Lord, then the chief desire of our hearts will be to know him better so we can delight in him even more. This isn't a promise for people who want things, but for those who want more of God in their lives. David understood the truth that our satisfaction isn't found in things, but in God himself. Trust in the Lord and do good. Delight in the Lord. And the third do, verse 5, is commit. Commit your ways to the Lord. Trust also in him and he'll do it. I mentioned my passion for expository teaching because it explains what the Bible means by what it says. We're going verse by verse this morning, but we can't always leave one verse for the next. Delight yourself in the Lord. We, we know what that means now, but, but how? How do we apply the wisdom David is showing us? He's telling us to delight in the Lord, which means to commit our ways to him and trust him. Proverbs 16.3 says, Commit your works to the Lord, and your thoughts will be established. Earlier I talked about how I've learned when God calls, I need to say yes. In learning to say yes, God had to reveal something about me. My selfishness. When asked to do something, my first thought is usually, do I have time? Can I fit this into everything that's on my list already? Or when an event is planned. And I'm asked to sign up in advance, I, I hesitate. I know it's a good thing. I might even know that I, I should do it, but I, I hesitate. You see, in the back of my mind, there's that voice saying, you might get a better deal. I might get a better deal. I, I, I. Do you hear it? But here's the thing. God only revealed my selfishness after I stepped out and made a commitment to serve him. I think some of you know what I mean. When we choose to follow God's call and trust in him, he helps us with all of those details. He'll even manage your calendar. Trust me. Worry, envy over what's going on all around us in this world or peace, protection, and satisfaction. It all comes down to trusting his plan. His plan that's better for you than your plan. So the question is, how confident are you in his ability? Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him. And he'll do it. Some translations read, and he shall bring it to pass. One author wrote, the one who has this delighted focus on God will see him bring these promises to pass. Fame and fortune are not promised, but the true and deep desires of the heart find their fulfillment. Pam and I attended the inductive Bible study class a couple months ago. And one of the first things that Dan taught was, was about observation. He said, first, read the passage. Then, read the passage. And finally, read the passage. As you can imagine, over the last week, I've, I've read these verses many times. Following Dan's advice, reading the verses over and again, I realized that some translations don't include the word also. Trust also in him. Is it so obvious that without the word, I should have just understood what the author meant? I wondered, so I started digging. Here's what I learned. In addition to God himself, he has given us so many things to enjoy. This year, as the green has started to emerge in our landscape, 
God has reminded me of the environment that he's given us here in the Pacific Northwest. For me, it feels so good right now to see the leaves on the trees, the flowers blooming. Yeah, and the snow melting in the Forest Service roads high in the mountains. He also tells us we can focus on God and enjoy the things he's given us. Not bad things, but good things. Summer's almost here, and the countdown is on for the school kids, and maybe for you too, as you look toward a vacation or maybe some needed time off. This word also, it's not instead of or in place of. So let's not put God on the shelf this summer. In David's wisdom, he did tell us first to commit our ways. So it begs the question, How are we going to do it all? Summers are busy. We have plans. Church, I think it comes down to this. As we place our trust in the Lord, if we delight in him, he'll do it. He'll bless us for our commitment. Allow us to enjoy the gifts he's given us. And still come to church on Sunday and attend our Bible studies and and serve as we're called. Again, trust. It's the main theme in the psalm. A well-known verse and a favorite of Pam's mom was Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he'll make your path straight. Acknowledge him. Focus on him. Delight in him. Trust in the Lord. Surrender each day and watch what happens. One day, you'll look back and give God all the glory for the work he's done in your life. Amen? Our third view continues in verse 6. He will bring forth your righteousness as the light and your judgment as the noonday. Again, if if our focus is on God first, then the things that are important to him will be important to us. Your righteousness and judgment or or justice are important to God. If we live out these don'ts and do's, if if we put aside worry and envy to trust and do good, to delight and commit our ways to him, then godly righteousness and justice come forth in our lives. What's important to God then becomes important to us. This has been my experience. When he calls and I say yes, what I thought was most important changes because I know he knows what's most important. If you don't believe me, listen for his call. Say yes. Watch. Watch what happens. So Pastor Jim gave me the first six verses for this morning, but God kept pointing me to just one more. One more do in verse 7. I'll call it do be still. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret because of him who prospers in his way, because of the man who carries out wicked schemes. Rest in the Lord. The verb means be silent, be still. It describes a calm surrender to the Lord. If you've experienced and and put to practice these don'ts and and do's in your life, you understand this. You have the assurance of God's promises and trust in what he'll do. You rest assured in our sovereign God. It's not always easy. And it's not like we never stumble. But we know the truth. Paul said in his letter to the Philippians, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. If you put to practice David's wisdom, these don'ts and do's, 
you can experience the peace of God. You can rest and be still. This morning, as we come forward for communion, as we receive the elements, the bread that represents Jesus' body broken for us, the cup that represents His shed blood that cleansed our sin, let's take a moment and be still, remembering and resting in all that He has done for us.